Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our weekly appointment for our catechetical sessions. This is the fourth of our sessions. Uh, we have started at Easter, and between Easter and Pentecost, we have thought of setting up something that allows a weekly appointment that allows us to meditate each week a bit more deeply on the meaning um, and uh, uh, the teachings of our faith. Now, so far we have taken a bit of a whistle-stop journey uh, through the life of Christ as it is manifested in the church, in the church calendar. So we have said we would make time for Christ by um, taking the church calendar, the church seasons, and follow the message that the church offers us uh, throughout its seasons and uh, its teaching as it is, as it shows as he teaches us about the life of Christ. So we have started, obviously, with the birth of Jesus. And we have said that the birth of God in our own midst was not an avatar, and it really took our flesh and bone, our human nature, and his stepping into space and time, our space and time, is the sacramental principle of Christianity. Um, so you might say that we've been looking at God as he has been incarnate in time, in our time, uh, but it is both in his human life and through the church here. Now, we have rapidly moved from the birth of Jesus to his baptism at Jordan. We have talked about the sacrament of baptism. Then we have moved to Good Friday. Uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, we've talked about the sacrament of the Eucharist. But before we carry on and analyze the incarnation in time, I think it's a good idea that we take a look at the manifestation of Christ's incarnation in space as well. Um, as we, just like the church proclaims the message of Jesus coming down to us through time, through, through the calendar, it also proclaims God stepping into this universe, into the fabric of sp space and time in its space, in the way that the church is built, the, the way churches are orientated. In fact, you can know a lot about um, a church's theology if you just look at the way the church is. So, come with me. We'll take a look at our church and the way and, and we'll take a look at what it means um, to have things as they are placed. So, I'll try to be as gentle as possible with the camera. As we enter from the west gates, we see the central nave with our beautiful high altar and our beautiful root cross on the side. And here, on, on top of the altar, obviously, and here on the side, on the left-hand side, we have the baptismal font. Now, you need to um, bear in mind one thing. There is a reason why the church is orientated the way that it is. Most churches, certainly churches uh, that are traditional in their outlook, are orientated towards the east, which means that these entrance gates are always at the west end of the church, and the altar is always at the east end. What do you think the symbolism might be for that? Think about this. When we turn towards the east, we turn towards Palestine, we turn toward Jerusalem, we also, and so we, we are facing the place where, where Jesus is born. We are also facing the um, place of Jesus' resurrection. We are also facing the place where he's coming again. 
we are, as we face East in prayer, we are seeking to find the risen Christ. So this is the reason why our churches are all orientated towards the East. Our body posture, our prayer life itself, in the way that it is structured, is aimed at looking for the risen Christ. So whenever we pray, we look for the risen Christ and we turn towards the East. Now, if there is the East and that is our altar where Christ makes himself present amongst us, why do you think generally at the opposite end, near the entrance, near the west door, we have the baptismal font. Why do you think the baptismal font is here at the west entrance? Well, for a simple reason. This is the means by which you enter the church. It's through our baptism that we are made part of the church, that we are engrafted into Christ, and that we are made part of his body, the church. Therefore, as we enter the church, our first stop is the baptismal font, where we are made into Christians, into part of the body of Christ. And because of our baptism, now we can be part of the church and pray as risen people in Christ who are looking for the risen Christ and facing the altar, facing east, as we are looking for the risen Christ as he makes himself present amongst us in the Eucharist. Another interesting thing, have you ever wondered why this central bit here and also the two lateral aisles here are called the, na the, the central nave and the lateral naves. Why the word nave, do you think? Well, the word nave comes from a Latin word, navis, which means ship. And in fact, if you look up, in a beautiful church like ours is actually quite evident, Look at the ceiling of the central nave. It looks like an upside-down boat. And it's supposed to have that resonance. It's supposed to have that significance. The whole church, where we are praying, where we are birthed into Christ, where we expect to see the risen Christ, where we pray as resurrected people, where we are made part of the body of Christ, is like a large ship, a boat, through which we can sail the waters of the world. And what is Bible reference here? What is the image that is evoked when we think about a ship that leads us to safety amongst the turbulent tempest of the sea? Obviously Noah's Ark. The church is taken us to the salvation of God, just like Noah's Ark. Um, was set up in order to preserve the life of creation. So this is the reason why, for, as I said, we call this the nave, coming from the word navis, the church. Now let's move to Our Lady Chapel, which is a miniature version of the larger, larger uh, part of the church. Similar, a similar setup here. So we have the altar facing east. In this case, we also have the tabernacle behind the altar. Tabernacle meaning, um, it's a reference to the Old Testament. In the desert, the Israelites were to car uh, carry the tabernacle with them where the presence of God was. Um, it was the tent of presence where the presence of God was. And here, therefore, in our tabernacles nowadays, we keep the reserved sacrament because we believe that Christ is really present in the sacrament, and his presence in the sacrament is his presence with us as well. Now, as we meditate on the, uh, on the shape of our churches, let's continue 
with our meditation on uh, um, on the, the the church calendar, and so um, we have left last time as um, um, remembering a good fr uh, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and um, and last session we we ended up with uh, the death on the cross with Jesus, but obviously for us as we have seen by the shape and meaning of our church, the orientation towards the East, for us Christians, that is not where the story ends. With the death of Jesus, that is not the last words. And it is tempting at this point to jump straight from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, forgetting, as I'm afraid, many traditions in contemporary church tend to do, what happens on Holy Saturday. Yet the Christian tradition insists that something very important happened between Jesus' death and his resurrection. Now, um, we repeat oftentimes the Apostles' Creed as well as the Nicene Creed, and there is one interesting sentence in the Apostles' Creed, um, which is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Ephes Ephes uh, Ephesians. It says that Jesus descended into hell. Now, why am I orientating the camera towards this icon? Because this icon, which is a traditional Eastern icon, represents exactly the moment of Holy Saturday leading to Easter Sunday. The Eastern Church has a tradition of icons descend, uh, um, representing the, the descent to hell. Now, look at this icon with me. I hope you can see it well. And I hope that I can point a few things that might be helpful for, you, for, for our meditation here. Now, look at the, the way that the icon is, is um, structured. So we have Jesus, obviously, at the center, and he is coming out, bursting out, almost forcefully upward from this bit underneath. Now, as you can see, there are bits and pieces of smashed things here. Those are bits and pieces of smashed hell. And here, perhaps you can make it out through the camera, there is a human-like bound figure in fetters. That's supposed to be death and Satan. Jesus has bound Satan in, in fetters, defeated death, smashed hell into smithereens, bits and pieces of smashed hell completely, and he is now standing over the gates of hell. These are the two sides of a large gate, gates of hell. In other icons, they are even put in a cross shape to remind us that he has destroyed death, uh, that his death destroyed death. And here he is freeing people from their tomb. And it's interesting that these two people, a man and a woman, are supposed to represent Adam and Eve, who are taken by the hand by Christ, going up in this almond-like shape which represents the resurrection. So Adam and Eve and Adam in Hebrew means humankind, humanity, mankind. So Adam and Eve as representatives of all men and women in the world throughout history, throughout time, are being taken out of their tomb, lifted up in the almond of the resurrection. The almond itself is an interesting figure. Whenever you see an almond in sacred art, it also, it always refers to the resurrection. It comes out of a Jewish legend that identified the sacrum, which is a bone in our spine, at the end of our spine, um, which was supposed, uh, supposedly, it, it, it wouldn't get destroyed by burning a cadaver. The idea was whenever you destroy the cadaver, there's always this sacrum, this little bone, 
shaped like an almond that never gets destroyed. And that's the reason why it's called the sacred bone or the sacrum, because it's holy. Sacrum in Latin means holy. Because that's the bone that Christ, that the God will take at the end of history to refashion your body around, uh, around fr from which to refashion your body. So it's, an, it's a claim of the resurrection. Well, that legend is here encapsulated in the in the sh in the almond shape of the resurrection. So, Jesus is by his resurrection, by his destruction of hell and death, by his binding of Satan and death, is taking Adam and Eve, and it's taking all humanity with them in the almond of the resurrection, going upwards towards the life of the eternal one. And look around Jesus, there are figures looking at them majestic miracle that is taking place god giving life to death human to death uh, human beings here you see you can see figures with crowns on their heads this is david this is solomon those are the old kings of the old testament this is supposed to be john the baptist the last of the great prophets so all the prophets and kings all the whole testament is looking forward to this victory of Christ. And now on this side is a deacon. You see, he's dressed like a deacon, an early church deacon with a, a shepherd staff and other figures. Those are all, this is the New Testament. This is the church now. The church looks back from this and lives. So the whole of history, the whole of humanity is taken up in the resurrection of Christ because he has destroyed death, he has gone down to hell, destroyed hell, freed the prisoners, and taken all humanity with himself into the resurrection and the life of God. Now, many artists and theologians have been inspired by the idea that before he could go up into heaven, Jesus had to go down as far as possible. And certainly this fits with the Christian idea of God who empties himself of his divinity. As we read in Philippians, he gave himself away completely. He didn't um, consider equality with God something to be held jealously, but emptied himself completely to ma making himself one of us, to assume our humanity. And even and and therefore it's consistent to even think that he emptied himself even of that humanity as he dies on the cross for us, reaching down to the very bottom of the pit of hell, so that to the place of absolute godlessness, you might say, so that he may save the whole of humanity and go up, take with himself, holding hands, the whole of humanity up with him. Jesus in Matthew 16, he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find. So you can say, this is a holy exchange. Jesus descends into hell. So that even those who have rejected God, like Adam and Eve, even those who have sinned, even those throughout history, can ascend into the fullness of the life of God, which we call heaven. So as we look at this icon and what it, it means, the kind of theology of Ephesians that it encapsulates, Philippians and Ephesians that it encapsulates, I wonder, what does this say about God's forgiveness? And in light of Jesus' descent into hell, how might we as Christians interact with people, particularly those who do not share our faith? Now, we have said that our entrance into Christ, in fact, our entrance into the church, our grafting into Christ, is by baptism. And we said uh, uh, when we meditated on the baptism of Christ that when we receive our Christian baptism, our original sin, the, the guilt of original sin, is washed away. Our guilt of sin is, is washed away. We received forgiveness of sins. And therefore, we are taken up into Christ. 
and being one with Christ, being made into his body, we are taken up into the, into the, the almond of the resurrection. We are taken into the life of God, into heaven. But baptism, the grafting into Christ, can be administered only once. What if we need forgiveness after baptism? What is the sacrament that the church has for forgiveness of sins in our everyday life? Yes. It's penance and confession. Yes, the sacrament of reconciliation, it's called, whereby forgiveness is made available to us at every point in our life that we may constantly be refashioned into the likeness of Christ as he takes us, our hands, and pulls us into the almond of the resurrection. Okay, so we have briefly looked at the shape of our church um, to meditate a bit on the, on the theology that sacred space as well as sacred time wants to transmit to us. And then we have analysed the icon of the Anastasis as we meditated a bit more on the events that take, take place between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. There is salvation that is offered that Christ provides to us at every point in his incarnation, life, death, resurrection, until obviously everything is drawn into one and the last word is spoken on the glorious Easter Sunday, the resurrection. Now, many people are confused, or to say it at the very least, um, are perplexed about the resurrection. I remember years ago passing in front of a pub um, who was, and they were obviously trying to attract punters by saying, come and, come and celebrate with us this week as we celebrate Jesus and his zombies. Uh, no, the resurrection is not Jesus coming as a sort of undead. At the same time, at the opposite end of the spectrum, then there are those um, modernist um, Christians that speak of the resurrection in terms of purely spiritual thing. It's the resurrection is a spiritual thing. No, 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 no. Um, Jesus is not a ghost or an idea that survives. The only historical data that we can draw about the resurrections are the accounts that we have received. And they talk about the Lord's appearances to the community of the disciples after his death. These are contained in the Gospels. And uh, I invite you uh, over this week to meditate on the post-resurrection narratives. Now, we are at the moment in the season of Easter. So every Sunday morning we have meditated a bit on the post-resurrection narratives. Do you remember we have talked about Christ encountering Mary Magdalene at Easter on the Easter Sunday, for example. Then we have talked about... Thomas, the second Sunday after Easter, Thomas encountering the risen Christ, Christ appearing for Thomas. And then we have talked about the Christ appearing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. There are a number of these post-resurrection narratives, Christ appearing to the disciples on the lake of Tiberias, cooking fish, and so on. I invite you to look at these post-resurrection narratives Jesus is recognized, and he's always recognized because of his actions. What do these stories have in common? And, of course, they have in common the fact that Jesus is very much alive, and the community understands Jesus to be very much alive. And there is a pit of confusion about physicality and spirituality there, because, of course, we do not know much about what awaits us after death, but the resurrection of Christ tells us a great deal already. We know that Christ's body in his post-resurrection appearance is very physical. Jesus eats with his disciples, for example. And yet we also know that it's a completely different physicality. It's a completely transformed 
understanding of the physical because Jesus is able to enter into a room with locked doors without going through the door. So, obviously, it's completely physical and completely different at the same time. But this doesn't take away from trusting the evidence. People often suppose that we cannot know anything about the afterlife because in the end nobody came back from it. Well, we Christians think that one did come back from it. And it's Jesus. And uh, we can trust this evidence that is contained in the Gospels because, you know, the Gospels give multi a multifaceted account of this one central event. And you can speak to anyone, you know, you can speak to investigators, even people who are being completely honest uh, in giving report and witness of an event. They will always give it, th their reports will always have something different in there because in the end they are filtering the event through their own experience, through their own eyes. And the Bible doesn't seek, in fact the church has not sought in 2,000 years, to erase these discrepancies, these differences, because... There are multiple accounts of the same event. Secondly, remember that this community that witnessed Christ alive after his death was willing to die for it. All the disciples died the death of the martyrs. It was so true and real that they decided to die rather than deny that that was true. So the resurrection is the reason why we say death is not the last word. And as we are in Christ, we are too taken in the life eternal of the resurrection, the life eternal of God. Now, many detractors of the Christian religion imagine that we are in it for ourselves um, to win favours and rewards to God, uh, suffering this life, um, and then you, you get your reward pie in the sky later. Um, no, that's not the way. You see, Christianity, we said, it's a sacramental religion. God, who is three in one, and has stepped into the fabric of space and time to save humanity, to take this humanity up with him, cannot obviously just deal with with the individual it's the salvation of humanity it's not just the salvation of me it's the salvation of us uh, we do not win favors for ourselves because god has already won us all the, his favor uh, by being incarnate in, amongst us by healing our humanity by dying for us by rising for us we can only join in with his sacrifice, with the sacrifice of Christ, letting him change us through the Mass, so that we too may live missionally and bring and, and show this love and this life that is in God to others. Thirdly, as we are seeing, Christ is not only died for the few, the few elect. The few who respond, no, 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 Christ's love is for humanity. He's taking the whole of humanity up in his arms. Because his, his death and resurrection has a cosmic significance. He wants the whole of humanity to be saved. Uh, St. Paul says the whole of creation is awaiting the manifestation of the children of God. The plan of God is to save the whole world. Okay. At the end of this session, I hope that you may recount the events of Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday and explain the meaning of Jesus' work of libera liberation as a sacramental gift of self. And also, I hope that you can point to the evidence of the resurrection um, and the hope of the, the divine life that we can obtain if the resurrection is true, as it is. So, I encourage you to read again the Apostles' Creed through this week and meditate on the meaning of the phrase, he descended into hell. What does it mean? And how can this aid us, help us in thinking about 
the work of salvation that Christ has accomplished for us. Read also through the stories of the resurrection in the Gospels and try to think of all, of all the thing, of what these stories have in common and what is their difference um, as well and what evidence, if any, can, can they offer um, about the historicity, the veracity of the resurrection. Um, is the resurrection reasonable, you think, then? What do we Christian mean when, the, when we proclaim the resurrection of Jesus? Jesus in Matthew says that he has come for the many, not the few. What does he mean in terms of salvation? What is the cosmic significance of the salvation of Jesus? Theologians use this word cosmic, meaning the whole cosmos is awaiting for the salvation of Christ. I'm going to um, conclude with a short prayer, but before I do that, I would like to encourage you not to think of heaven versus earth or um, either or. No, no, Christianity doesn't think of this reality of space and time as a sort of prison to escape from. No. Jesus has stepped into this fabric of space and time because he, wants to, because he wanted to heal us and he wanted to take us to his reality. This world has become the vehicle of heaven. You see, ordinary bread and wine become the vehicle of the real body and the real blood of Christ that transform us, that consume us as we consume them. Therefore, the fabric of space and time has become the vehicle for the manifestation of the glory and the salvation of God. Christianity is not just about the hope of the afterlife. It is a religion where heaven and earth meet because they meet in Jesus. Um, because heaven and earth meet in our risen Lord, the life of the Eternal One is a life that we can already make, find present here. I'm going to finish with a short prayer and then a, and then a short blessing. Let us pray. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death, to make all things new in him. Grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory. To whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And see you again next week. Bye-bye.